welcome everyone to One Talk, our One Talk program this evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Katie Hawk, and I'm the Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications at Sansom Diabetes Research Institute. SDRI is based out of Santa Barbara, California, and we are a nonprofit dedicated to improving the lives of people impacted by diabetes. And we are celebrating a really important milestone this year, the 100th anniversary of insulin. Our founder, Dr. William Sansom, was the first US physician to manufacture and administer insulin right here in Santa Barbara. His life-saving work in diabetes research has had a profound impact on millions of individuals living with diabetes. This evening, I am thrilled to have two incredible panelist speakers discuss the first tubeless automated insulin delivery system, the Omnipod 5. <laughs> Woohoo! The long awaited. Uh, on January 28th, Insulet announced the FDA clearance of the Omnipod 5 uh, AID system for people with type 1 diabetes who are six, uh, six years and older. And SDRI is so proud to say that we were one of the 16 sites across the United States to participate in the pivotal trial of the Omnipod 5. I want to welcome our first panel speaker, Dr. Trang Lai. Trang is a senior vice president and chief medical officer at Insulet Corporation. And Trang leads the Omnipod 5 clinical program and is a leading expert in artificial pancreas and diabetes technologies. She's also a pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, our second panelist speaker, Carol Hornbuckle, has lived with type 1 diabetes for over 30 years and has two children with type 1 diabetes. Kara and her son participated in the Omnipod 5 clinical trial at SDRI, and they've used the system for over two years. So there's a lot of real world data and um, experience that Kara will be sharing this evening as well. Trang and Kara, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm so grateful for your time. Before we begin, I want to just go over a few housekeeping items. Um, our, be our meeting is going to be rec is being recorded and will be posted on SDRI's YouTube channel. I'll send out an email link once it's available. In the next couple of days, it will be available. And if you have any questions, um, you can post that in the chat box. You can do the, the Q&A feature, however works best for you. We want to hear from you. And we'll get to as many of them as we can in the last 15 minutes um, of our time. If it goes a little bit over, you're welcome to stick around if you need to head out at the hour mark that's fine by us uh, thank you all so much for being here and i want to let kara and train get it started thank you so much katie for that warm welcome we are i am so excited to be here and i know you are too train um <laughs> sure. it's, it's, it's so special to have this time with you you know i respect you so much and all the important work that you do for the diabetes community i um the diabetes community has been waiting for such a long time to have the first automated insulin delivery system that is tubeless. And I'm hoping you can share with us all that went into making this, this system FDA approved. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Hi, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here today. We're going to try and cover a lot of questions between uh, Kara and me tonight. Um, yeah, so it's been a really long time in the making for Omnipod 5. Uh, I first learned of this program uh, six years ago when I, I was at Stanford and I was involved in a bunch of closed loop research there and there was no tubeless AID system on the market. And I remember, you know, I had patients at Stanford who refused to take part in the studies that I was doing with tubed pumps, um, AID systems, and they really, really wanted a tubeless AID system. So um, Insulet had licensed an algorithm um, six years ago, uh, but really, you know, the engineering work had only just begun and really there was no clinical work underway. So over um, these past six, almost seven years, um, there's been a ton of work underway to prove that the system is safe in people uh, living with diabetes um, across a broad range of ages, which includes children um, and even younger children down to the age of two. And then, um, you know, all the fantastic engineering to put the algorithm on the pod and keep the pod small um, and, you know, not any larger, you know, not require any more battery, still lasting three days and working well on body with um, a wireless CGM system. So all of that and um, now with phone control as well, which is really, really remarkable. So yeah, it's been a long time in the making, lots of clinical trials, which uh, you and Lucas have been part of, and I could not be more proud to be bringing this technology to the diabetes community. 
Thank you so much. Now, can you tell us why this system is considered a breakthrough device? Yeah, so it, um, what that means is when FDA reviewed this, it um, got priority um, compared to other devices. And that is because it's such a unique system. So it's a tubeless AID system. Um, so there are other AID systems and AID, I mean, automated insulin delivery systems on the market, but there is no uh, tubeless system. And um, the, the reason why it's so important is, you know, we need more therapies. We need more therapies for young children in particular. You know, often these systems are first cleared for adults, um, but we know that a lot of children get diagnosed with diabetes from an early age. And it's just so important that we get um, good glucose control in those children, you know, really as quickly as possible so that their metabolic memory is um, really preserved as much as possible in their metabolic control so that, um, you know, the longevity that they have living with d this disease and the impact, we can minimize that impact uh, of diabetes on the rest of their lives. So it, it is um, really a high um, public health need diabetes, you know, it affects so many people and it, you know, people will die from it. You know, the, the consequences of, um, of uh, too much insulin results in seizure and loss of consciousness and death and not enough results in DKA and long-term side effects and, you know, all the complications. So it, it has, a really incredible, enormous impact, not just for the individual, but for families, and then is an enormous public health um, problem as well. And so it's not a rare disease, and that's why it needs um, prioritization. Excellent. Now, I got to know, what did you do when you found out that the Omnipod 5 had been released and it was approved <laughs> by the FDA? You know, I was like so nervous and shaking um, when it happened because, you know, I'm the kind of person who's really skeptical. So until like I see it in my hot little <laughs> hand, I'm like, I think it's not going to happen. Um, I think I texted my team um, first. I, um, you know, Alex is on the call. I, I think I let them know first because, you know, we've just been working on this for so long and, and, um, you know, it it just didn't feel real that it, it, we were going to get this cleared and, and you know, hundreds of thousands of people were going to get access to this. So um, so I think I texted my team first and I think I called, you know, one of my families back at Stanford. I, I think you were the uh, third person maybe that I called. <laughs> um, and then I called, you know, all the doctors who've been part, with us on a part of this journey um, you know, if it wasn't for all the doctors and all the patients who take part in this, Omnipod 5 would never come to life. You know, like your data, Lucas's data, Katie's data, it's in the user guide under all the clinical data that we have to collect um, in order to get this uh, type of breakthrough innovation approved by uh, FDA. So, you know, there's a really high bar of safety and efficacy that we have to prove. Sure, sure. Well, you know, you talked or you just mentioned data. And so can you tell us about the data and the cl clinical trials? Yeah, um, you know, what I'm really proud of is the time and range that uh, we achieved and the reduction in A1C. So in the adults, um, you know, we uh, improved time and range to 74% uh, overall. So that was um, children down to the age of 14, all the way up to adults up to the age of 70. Um, so there, you know, just a really remarkable improvement there. And then uh, A1C reduction and then the lowest hypoglycemia out of, you know, all the commercial systems, um, which I'm really, really proud of because, you know, it's really important that people can trust the system. And in an AID system, you can't, you know, create more hypoglycemia because that really makes people lose trust with the system. So um, just really, you know, really fantastic clinical trial results. And yeah, I'm really proud of uh, what we've built. And, and um, you know, actually now might be a good time for me to ask you some questions. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so, um, so people don't know you. And so do you want to share like just 
a little bit rewind to before you used Omnipod 5 and sure. you know what what were you using at the time what were you hoping to get out of this clinical trial and sure. you know your early impressions sure absolutely so gosh that was over two two years ago it was January of uh, 2020 and I remember just being excited for the opportunity to be in this this clinical research study and at the time I was looping um, so really what I was wanting I was I was just so hopeful I was I was so hopeful to have more time and range and less time having to think about managing diabetes that was what was really important to me the other thing that I think is important to everybody who lives with diabetes or has a child with diabetes is just to have better sleep at nighttime. And that was something that was critical to both my husband and I, of course, because we wanted, you know, more time sleeping for me with any low or high blood sugars I may have, but also for Lucas as well. And so that was, that was really important to, to both of us. And then I think what was as a mother, what was really important to me and what I was so hopeful for with the Omnipod 5 system was that this was this time where Lucas, you know, is 10 years old and he's getting ready to, to be able to do things that, you know, an average 10 year old should be able to do on their own without their parent around, like going to, a, you know, sports practice or whatnot. And so I was hoping that this system would really give him that opportunity where we would feel safe being able to leave him alone at, at sports events or at sleepovers and, you know, all those opportunities so that he could really have that independence that he needs and also that he deserves. Awesome. And so when you started using Omnipod 5, what, tell us about your experience with it and how, how did, did you find it? I was so happy um, with the system. You know, before we, before I started on the system, I was, you know, I was a little nervous. I was skeptical, trying something new always. Um, you know, I was, I was nervous that maybe there would be some weird things that in order to be in auto mode, you'd have to kind of go in and out of it. And I have been so happy with being on the system and also with Lucas being on the system um, as well. It has delivered what I've wanted for him to be able to have that, that level of independence. He's at a baseball practice right now without me or without my husband, I can, you know, see what's going on. And it's just, it's really special to, to be able to have that. And I'll mention this a lot, I'm sure throughout our time this evening, but the sleep, the sleep has just been incredible. Our alerts rarely go off in the middle of the night. And it's what's important to, to us is that, you know, or to everybody who lives with diabetes is that during that time that one, you can be rested, but also that blood glucose levels are really tight. And that's what we found uh, for both of us. So it's, it's been amazing for us to have this this type of support um, to better manage our diabetes. And really what I think is important is just it, we spend less time thinking about diabetes and more time just living and enjoying our life. That's wonderful. And, you know, I, I've taken care of a lot of teenagers in my time. And so Lucas must be 12 now, right? He'll be 12 next month. Yep. Yeah. So he's definitely got some preteen business going on. Oh, yep. Uh, yeah. How, how do you, uh, how's the system handling, you know, his growing needs sure. and um, possibly some insulin resistance and increasing needs there? That's a, that's a great, that's a great point. And I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because when he started on the system, his A1C was at a 7.2 and within, a, I want to say a six week period, his A1C went to a 6.4. And the system, I mean, it, it was really, really impressive. I, I remember going to the appointment and checking in with the nurse practitioner. I'm like, can you read that to me one more time? Can I have a copy of that? Is this, is this real? Um, so that was just incredible that the system was working so quickly um, and, and helping to manage his blood sugar levels. And so it really does a great job about learning our body and understanding you know, what's going on so that when you do that site change, it's going to adapt to that, um, you know, to those needs. And so, and, and also just, speaking freely, being a woman, it helps a lot with all the hormonal things that are going on within my body too. So it's been, it's been really effective. And I, I actually don't know the answer to this question. So it's a little bit risky, but like, how's his A1C in like the last year? 
oh, the last year, it's, it's considered, it's, it's the same. I mean, he's, he's really, still, yeah, he's, he's still at, he's still at a, a about a 6.4, I believe it was his last appointment in December. Wow. I know. That's amazing. I know. I know. It's great. I, I know. I, I look at it and I'm, this is great. So, so even during all this growing, all these things, I mean, he's really going through that puberty right now. It's been fantastic at helping to manage that. Well, that's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. You know, it is the reason why I left clinical practice to take on this job was I just knew that, you know, seeing my patients once every three months is, I just can't take care of them the way that, you know, Omnipod 5 can take care of Lucas. So I'm just uh, really happy to hear that. So thanks for sharing. Oh, of course. I'm going to keep going because uh, you're far more interesting than I am. Oh, so. I don't know about that, Trang. <laughs> No, I, I'm going to keep asking questions. Um, so you have um, one child who is, um, you know, 12 and, you know, doing well on Omnipod 5. And then um, you texted me around December timeframe with some other news. Um, yeah. Can you share that? Yes, I can. So as you sh- shared, Lucas was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 2. And in December, I remember it was my first day off um, from work for the holiday. And we had done so many fun things that day. We'd gone to a basketball game and it was just, I always look forward to that time of the year um, because both my husband and I are off and we're just, we really have that opportunity just to be so present with our family. And that night, my husband said to me, he said, you know, Cameron's been drinking a little bit more water than normal. And I thought, you know, it is a little bit more, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't like, like Lucas. And he said, we need to check her blood sugar level. So we ended up checking her blood sugar level and it said high on uh, our, our blood glucose machine. And I was absolutely devastated. I, this, you know, I, I thought to myself, how could, how could this disease impact our life? so many times. I have it. My son has it. We had just gotten to this point because of Omnipod 5 that Lucas was really being able to be independent and our life had really just changed as a result of that. And now we had to go through this all over again uh, with Cameron. And that was, that was horrible. I mean, she, Lucas is, is, you know, they're both amazing children. Um, She's a little bit more strong-willed. And so I was very worried about how she was going to adapt to having to live with diabetes. Um, even when we were trying to check her blood sugar that, that first night to see what it was, we had to hold her down uh, just to do a finger stick. And so I'm thinking, what are we going to do moving forward for all the shots and the finger sticks and everything else that, that comes with this? And how are we going to negotiate, you know, meals and whatnot? So that was, that was a really, that was a really hard period um, to get through. And I remember texting you because I just thought, you know, I have got to get her on a a closed loop system and she refused to wear um, any of the systems that were out because they had tubes. Um, So I had to, you know, negotiate with her. So we ended up keeping her on um, injections until the Omnipod 5 system uh, was available. And I remember texting you in desperation and, okay, training, when's this going to be approved? Like, I need this now. (laughs) Um, And you're like, be patient. It's going to be soon. So, um, yeah, that was, that was definitely a shock. It was so hard for my husband. Um, I mean, it was hard for me too, of course, but you know, he didn't talk for a couple of days or didn't talk that much for a couple of days. Cause he was really just in a, a state of shock. And then when he was kind of recovering and then when the kids were going back to school and our routine was back into schedule, that's when it was, um, ex- exceptionally hard, hard for me. Um, but I am so thankful because, but one of the things I do want to share with you in the group is I remember the night that that Cameron was diagnosed, I said to Lucas, I said, you know, how are you feeling about this? You know, I have type one, you have type one. And now Cameron has been diagnosed with type one. How, how do you feel about all this? And he said, mom, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, she's going to be fine. We'll get her on an Omnipod five. It's going to be okay. And so when he said that to me, I thought, that was just, I mean, he doesn't think about all the things that a mom or dad, you know, would think about, but I thought, gosh, this is such a testament to the advances that have been made in his lifetime, you know, for type one diabetes. Um, And thankfully we've been able to get her on an Omnipod 5 system. And that has just been a game changer for her. 
Yeah, well, thank you for sharing the story. I, um, I can't imagine, you know, the, the feelings of guilt and, you know, maybe shame that you would yeah. have felt as a mom with type one and now having a second child with type one, um, you know, it must have been really hard. So mm -hmm. I wish I was closer so I could give you a big hug. Oh, I know. I need a hug from you. <laughs> soon. Very soon. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so I remember um, you getting Omnipod 5 for Cameron mm -hmm. and you're a little wary about the first couple of days with her because she was newly diagnosed yeah. and so her insulin doses would have been low. Right. Do you want to talk through how that all went? Right, right. I was um, I was skeptical because I thought, how is this going to work? She's hardly on any insulin. You know, is this device going to be smart enough to kind of figure that out? And I remember texting you the first morning. She had worn it overnight. And here it is. It was, she was at 90 the, the whole entire night, you know, her, her, um, her graph. And so it works beautifully with her and, and just having, you know, she's still in that honeymoon phase and it, it works really well. She has great control and um, it's just been so nice for us to, to only have to change the pump every couple of days instead of having to give those shots. So it's been aggressive enough and it's been, it's, it's really done a wonderful job with, with this, with, for her. That's great. So great to hear. Um, and how old were you when you were diagnosed, Cara? I was six. Oh, okay. So really little too. Right. And, and do you remember things that you were taught that you, that you have um, said, I'm never going to make my children do this? Yeah. Um, I'm a product of the 80s for, you know, I was born in the 80s and I'm a product of being living with diabetes in the 80s. And anybody who's watching this tonight, who's that time period, you can remember just like it was instilled that you do the exchange diet. You know, you have to have your carb and you have to have your fruit, then you have to have your vegetable, your protein or whatever it is. And we were just kind of told, you know, you had to eat at this time of day and then you could eat again at this time of day. And I just don't want to ever have to have that level of restriction for my, for my kids. Um, and for myself, you know, I want to be able to kind of go with the flow. And I think by nature, we all kind of have a, a bit of a schedule anyway, with our, with our eating routines, but it just was so fixed. And so that's something for me that I want to make sure that my kids know that there's flexibility in that. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Yes. Um, do you want to ask them? Yes, ask them? I do. I was just going to say now, can I have, can you talk a little bit? <laughs> I've spilled my guts. Um, all right. So, you know, there are a lot of people that might be on this call that haven't used a closed loop system and they're nervous about giving up control. Can, can, what advice would you give them? What safety procedures are in place? Yeah. Um, you know, it's um, we've built this system for people of all walks of life um, using all different therapies. In our clinical trial, we took people who were using multiple daily injections and we put them straight onto the system and just let it run. And um, so it's it's not a device for people who are who are pumpers already or for you know people who are really into their diabetes or a sophisticated segment. It's, it's really not meant for that. It's really meant for everybody. And um, it is designed specifically to be simple and easy to use. And um, what we mean by that is, you know, we've thought about this um, very deliberately in terms of both the design as well as the algorithm. So um, in terms of the product, it's very similar to our Omnipod Dash product, which is our tubeless um, insulin delivery system on the market already. And the setup is very similar. You know, you go in, you set up the basal program, and then you set up the bolus um, calculator settings. And, and these are settings that you would be guided through with your healthcare provider um, to, to work through, you know, what um, would normally be required for dosing for a person your size. Um, so, you know, like Cara's dosing is different from Lucas's dosing, which, which is different from Cameron, who was, you know, diagnosed within the last few weeks. Um, so everybody has different needs, but the starting off is just very simply how you would start a person on a pump. 
And then what the algorithm does is it takes that information and it uh, adjusts the insulin delivery every five minutes to deliver just enough insulin to keep you at the target glucose. So within our system, you can set a target glucose between 110 and 150 in 10 milligram per deciliter increments. Um, so if you've got a child and you're really worried about lows overnight or it's a brand new system and you don't want them to crash low, you can set a higher target glucose. Um, and then you can set a lower one during the day if that's your preference or whatever your preference is, you can set that. And then the system every five minutes takes in a CGM value from a Dexcom G6 sensor, uh, figures out how much insulin on board you have, predicts what you're going to be in an hour, and then doses exactly the amount of insulin you need in that five minute increment. So that's what an AID um, system can do. And it... Um, it really, uh, the other thing it does is it adapts over time. So if you are running persistently high, it will give you more insulin over time. And if you're running persistently low, it will reduce um, the amount of insulin over time as well. And so that is something we really thought hard about because we know that teenagers, um, like Lucas will grow and is going to need more insulin. And so if he's running high, we want to be delivering more. We don't want people to have to wait and go see their endo to tweak their settings. We really want um, it to really adapt to patients' needs. And same thing, you know, it has to be really safe for someone like Cameron who was just starting out in her journey. And then it has to work well for adults who've had it for a long time. So we really had to test the algorithm in a broad range of patients in order to get an algorithm that we, we feel really um, you know, confident in, in being able to address the needs of a large population of people. That's great. And I think you touched a little bit on this, but do you think you could talk a little bit more about how the algorithm and how the system really learns your body? Yeah. So primarily it does that through um, every every five minute cycle it is basing the insulin delivery on the the glucose trajectory right so if you're running high it's going to give you more uh, as i mentioned and then over time it um, adapts based on the total daily insulin delivered through the day so it takes all the basal insulin delivery that is delivered and then all the bolus insulin delivery and for someone who takes in a lot of insulin, so if someone's using, you know, 60, 70 units a day, the algorithm's going to know that, look, this patient can handle it. So we're going to give a lot more insulin, even though the glucose is at 100, you know, and then vice versa. You know, if someone um, only boluses very small amounts and their basal insulin delivery is not very much, then their total daily insulin is going to be a lot lower uh, like how much is Cameron on right now? Total daily. Oh, total daily. She's probably between five and six units. And, and Lucas right. is like on 60 and I'm on like yeah. 30. Yeah, exactly. So that's a pretty big difference in insulin, right? Because just a, like, like Cameron doesn't need very much at all. And so that system has adapted for her, even for that very small amount of insulin delivery. So that, that's why, um, uh, so that's how it works is based on total daily insulin. And so it knows that the pump knows that information because it tracks every bolus dose that's delivered and all the insulin that's delivered by the system. And then with every pod change, it the algorithm has all that information and it will continue to adapt based on the TDI that's accumulated with every pod change. TDI is total daily insulin. Excellent. Yeah, I've been really impressed with how after every site change, now switching over from the steady version versus now to the commercial uh, you know, system, how it just keeps getting more and more aggressive and knowing, and, and knowing your body. So that's been amazing. That's great. <laughs> okay, this is a big question that a lot of people want to know is when do you think this system will be compatible with iOS? So we're working on it and we haven't... Um, said a date yet so we haven't publicly set a date for ios so okay. right now we're in a phase called our limited market release 
where um, a selected number of people have uh, access to the product. And part of that is, you know, we're not just releasing a, a new product. Um, we're very confident in the product because it's been tested by volunteers for two years now. Um, but there's actually a lot that goes into releasing a product, um, including, you know, all the onboarding services that we're doing. Um, it's all, you know, 100% digital pathway for someone who is, you know, already on Omnipod Dash and G6. You know, they can self-train onto Omnipod 5 and um, be on their merry way without having to interact with any insulate person. Um, so, you know, there's a, just a lot in terms of the IT infrastructure and all of that, that we need to make sure works really well um, before we really, you know, open the floodgates for everybody. And then, you know, what we're also doing during this time is making sure that people have access. So we're getting Omnipod 5 onto certain plans to make sure that, you know, when you go and see your doctor that you your insurance covers it. Um, so right now, you know, Omnipod Dash is uh, very, very well covered through the pharmacy channel, um, something like 90% of um, covered lives in the US are, are covered for Omnipod Dash, which is the most for any insulin pump, in fact. Um, and so we are hoping uh, very quickly that our, our teams are working on it to ramp up the access for Omnipod 5 for, um, for people um, who have coverage. Um, so yeah, just a, a really have so during limited market release, what we have released is the product on a um, standalone insulet provided controller, um, which you can use and carry. And I think that's what you're using, and then also phone control as well with um, selected Android phones. So I think we have about seven models. S10 was first, but, you know, we have um, others, S9 and various other models as well. And what that means is, you know, people can um, uh, download Omnipod 5 uh, straight from the Google App Store and um, their Dexcom app as well, and they can run it and at the same time make phone calls and text and, and um you know, do all those wonderful things that we do with our other appendage, uh, which is our phone, and control their Omnipod uh, as well. So it's super, super exciting. And that was just released a few weeks ago. And the reason why we started with Android first is because the original uh, Omnipod 5 system was an Android-based app. And then, um, you know, it was, it was um, you know, straightforward to put that onto an Android uh, platform first and then we are working on iOS I've been testing it out because I test out all the systems <laughs> and it looks beautiful so I can't oh, wait good. <laughs> well if so you need you any can... other anybody else to test it just let me know <laughs> <laughs> I I definitely will uh, so yeah it's you know it's in the works um, and we're working we're all working as fast as we can because we know, it, you know, it's really important for people to be able to manage their devices from their iPhones and, um, you know, from their smartphones. So Android is first, iOS is coming. We haven't said when, but it doesn't mean you can't use Omnipod 5 just because right. you're an iPhone user. You can still use it. Yes, I think that's really important to, to clarify that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so It's a you, bit of a misnomer, so yeah. Right, right. So I think it, this would be a good time for you to um, to talk about the Omnipod uh, promise and what that is. Um, okay, I I think this is um, where you first, um, if if you're already on Omnipod Dash, you um, will um, be able to switch over to um, Omnipod Five. Um, and we're not, uh, we're expecting price, price parity between Dash and Omnipod 5. So we're not um, expecting any uh, additional price um, rise with Omnipod 5. So it means people who are already on Omnipod Dash will have access to Omnipod 5 once they have coverage for it. Um, so it doesn't limit um, people's you know, ability to access. And I think that is very different for Omnipod compared to the other pumps on the market, because um, traditionally, you know, 
the tubed pumps are um, what they call durable medical equipment. So they're covered under um, that those plans where there is, you know, often a large out-of-pocket cost for people. And so um, what's really innovative with Omnipod is being able to access it through the pharmacy channel where um, the majority of our patients pay uh, less than $50 a month for their pods in the pharmacy. Wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're not locked in for four years and we right. don't charge them for the PDM. And so it, it really is about getting innovation to our patients as quickly as possible and not limiting them in four year plans. Um, so that's something, you know, really unique to Omnipod. And, and um, it's just really, um, you know, quite remarkable. I, I don't know if you saw my LinkedIn post last week, but I, I went to a pharmacy in Tennessee and they had Omnipods on the shelf, like Omnipod Dash pods on the shelf. That is so, so it, cool. Isn't that crazy? Like, that is. so a doctor could prescribe. You a, can just get it. You can just get it. You, you they can prescribe wow. Omnipod and get it the same day. And it means, you know, our newly diagnosed families can get, get access to technology really quickly. You know, they can get their Dexcom, get their pods uh, via pharmacy, you know, no long wait times and really just get on their way. Um, so, you know, these things are, I think, are really meaningful differences for oh, people absolutely. because absolutely. access and cost is really the number one limiting factor for people getting access to technology. Right, right. right. And that's always heartbreaking when somebody's just struggling to get that. Um, okay, speaking of access, when do you think this will be available for anybody who wants the system? So we're... Um, We'll be ramping up slowly um, in the next little while. And what we've said publicly in the last few weeks is um, that our limited market re release will take between three to nine months. Okay. So you know, we're a few months in now and, <laughs> um, and, you know, we're evaluating and we're seeing how sure. things go. And initial uh, feedback has been really great. You okay. know, I get lots of people sending me, you know, wonderful um, traces of, you know, the first time that they've slept, um, Aww. you know, in 20 years and just really, really wonderful feedback, um, from people using the product for the first time. So it's, it's been really incredible, but it's like, it's enormous. Like you can just imagine, you know, there are 7,000 endocrinologists out there and right. like, there's a lot of training to do. And then, you know, like someone like Alex, we have to multiply him and his team, you know, <laughs> to make him. sure, <laughs> you know, to make sure that people are having a really good experience. And then, you know, so there's just like a lot to do, um, just the sheer scale of it. And we know that all of our Omnipotters are going to want it you know, on right. day one. So we're just right. working hard to make sure that, that the, the system doesn't have a meltdown, you know, so yeah, that's what we're working through right now. Okay. That's great. All right. Do you want to ask me anything? Yes. Um, so uh, what age, so I have two kids, you have two kids, my kids are much younger, but speaking of phone control, what age um, do you think it's appropriate for kids to have a phone? Oh, wow. Okay. So for if they have diabetes or just in general? I'm just curious from a mother to mother perspective. Okay. <laughs> oh my uh, goodness. It's a pretty kind of contentious issue, but I'm curious to know, you know, do you, are you more um, lenient because Lucas has diabetes yeah. and how do you manage all of that and okay. social media and yes. all that? Yes. You know what? That's a really good question because I'll tell you one of the most annoying things since Cameron has been diagnosed with type one is the phone because she'll be in the living room and I'll be in our bedroom, which is not too far away. And she'll just be calling me nonstop on phone. Mom, can you do this? And mom, can you do that? Or if she's with me and she doesn't like what I'm saying about, you know, whatever we're working on or doing, she'll call Jeff on the phone and say, well, mommy's not letting me do this. Are you going to let me do this? And then she'll do, you know, kind of vice versa. So that's been the hardest, not the hardest, but that has been an adjustment with her being on a phone. Um, so you, you had know, to do that because of Dexcom. Is that exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah, right. Because of Dexcom, um, because of Dexcom. 
So that's a good question because Lucas is just starting to get, I mean, he's had a phone since he was really little, uh, you know, didn't know how to use it most of the time, but he had it to manage his diabetes with his Dexcom. I think for me, it's, you know, I once heard a parent say they let their child in high school have a phone, but the phone every night stayed in their room and it charged every night in their room so they could see kind of what was monitoring it and, and whatnot. Um, Lucas has started with uh, Google Chats uh, with a couple of his friends on his phone, but I know who those who those children are, um, and I think I really respect their parents uh, quite a bit. So I think you know for logistics and convenience, it's really nice for your children to have a phone because you can get a hold of them. You know, just like I my girlfriend was taking Lucas to practice tonight, and I'm texting him. I'm like, "Did you make it?" And he did, and so I'm like, "Okay, cool, peace of mind." But um, there's so much going on in social media. And prior to Lucas having type one, I, um, you know, I was a school counselor and it's just all of the social media stuff is just really magnified. So I, I would think maybe high schoolish would, would be right um, for, for me. Yeah. So right now he has his diabetes apps yep. and Google chat and then that's and it. Google chat. Yes. And yeah. phone, so he can yes. text you. Yes, he can right. call us. Yep. Yeah, but yep. no social media. Oh, no, 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 no social media. I hope he never has that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you think Cameron's going to be like? Oh, man, she's, uh, she is, she's amazing. She's a leader. She's a spitfire. She, I feel like both Jeff and I, like the, are the, the, we're strong-willed, like the, she has it like magnified times like a million. Um, and so she's, she's going to be a leader in what, in whatever she does. I'm, I'm really proud of her. Yeah. So you're, you're just hoping that you make it to age 12. <laughs> in like yeah, exactly. probably unlikely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. going to like come up with a really strong argument for her to. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Well ahead of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My husband does say, I'm so glad we don't have girls uh, every once in a while. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. If you, you would have been at our house last night, you would have said, and I'm sure. I'm very happy we don't have girls. <laughs> awesome. Uh, do you have questions for me? Oh, yeah, I do. So you, there's so many different fields you could have chosen and so many things you could have done with, you know, with your career. Why did you choose to, to diabetes and endocrinology? Yeah. So. Um, I, um, I worked, I spent a long time in the emergency room uh, when I uh, was just out of training. So uh, as an intern, um, just really loved working in the pediatric um, department. And, um, you know, some of the sickest children who ever came in were kids coming in with DKA um, and, you know, newly diagnosed families. And so, um, you know, I really just um, felt like I wanted to take care of them for a longer time and not just see them in the emergency room. And, um, you know, it's a really serious um, condition when you come right. in with DKA and, you know, they're comatose sometimes and, you know, they need to be resuscitated. So um, really it's, and, and then, you know, it's just such a devastating illness to, um have to confront when when you have a child um with type one and um you know it it really kind of changes the hopes and dreams that you have um for your child with the diagnosis so um so yeah I was just really drawn to um taking care of the families and so I um, pursued the, my fellowship in endocrinology. And um, at that time, you know, there was um, diabetes technology sensors and all of that were just coming out to the market. So this was back in, you know, 2007, 2008. Oh, yeah. And um, all that technology at that time was new. You know, the sensors were really inaccurate. They hurt a ton when you put it on. And so it was just all really early stage um, technology. And then, um, yeah, I, um, I am Australian. So I did all my training in Australia. And then I moved to um, California, uh, Stanford, um, where I met Tamar, who's on the call tonight. 
um, and um, worked with Dr. Bruce Buckingham there at Stanford for um, several years. And, um, you know, I just really love taking care of people with diabetes. Um, I just think it's something that's sort of hidden that we don't talk about a lot. You know, I always say, you know, when someone gets diagnosed with diabetes, nobody sends them flowers, you know, and right. it's just people are expected to kind of carry on and right. like it's a big deal, but it's a really big deal and it affects right. a huge part of the population. And it's kind of really devastating to see how it can affect people's lives. Um, like it just, changes the trajectory of people's lives you know um so so yeah I thought I'd um you know I thought I'd be at Stanford for 20 years taking care of patients with diabetes and doing fun research but um you know I'm feel so grateful to have had this opportunity to to be at Insulad and help them you know bring Omnipod 5 to market and you know it's really I feel like it's probably the most important work that I'll do in my lifetime. Well, I'm so glad you're doing it. And I think everybody in the type one community is, is definitely thankful to people like you who just make so many sacrifices so that people like me can have this type of, you know, technology in our lives. So before we turn it over to the audience questions, I just, I want to ask you one last question and okay. I want you to, I want you to finish the sentence. My greatest hope with Omnipod 5 is that people with diabetes will? Uh, live better lives. <laughs> live their best life. Live their best life. That's wonderful. Well, Katie is back on and I know there's been some buzz in the chat over here with some questions. So Katie, why don't you take it from here? All right. <clears throat> Trang and Kara, thank you so much. It's just so great to hear not only the mechanics of Omnipod 5, but the history, trying to hear all about your training and you know what led you and your passion to follow this. And we're just so grateful that you did follow that because I don't think we'd be here today. Uh, so thank you so much. And Kara, just it's amazing and incredible to hear your, your story and how you were all thriving. I mean, it's, um, it's just such a testament to, to you and Jeff too. So I don't want that to get lost in, in the story either. Um, so there has been a lot of questions in the chat box around the, um, the algorithm, kind of the mechanics of that. So Trang, can you talk a little bit about how the algorithm learns your body and um, the expectations around that? Yeah, so Primarily, it works, um, as I mentioned, on um, the, so it takes the information, you know, every five minutes and it augments insulin delivery. So if you're running high all the time, it's going to give you a, plenty of insulin and it's going to try and bring you down to the glucose target. That's, that's its primary aim. That's what it's designed to do. And then it adapts based on that total daily insulin. So it calculates all those microboluses that it delivers every five minutes. And then it um, tracks all the boluses that you're delivering through the day. Um, it knows when you go high and when you go low. And then based on all of that information, it will decide how much insulin you need when you start a new pod. And so that adaptivity occurs at every new pod. And, um, you know, when you start the system up initially, um, it uses more conservative settings because, you know, people sometimes enter in the wrong settings. So the system wants to know, um, you know, if the, these are appropriate settings for this person. And then in the, the next pod, it will give more insulin with that second pod and then subsequent pods after that it will adapt based on the total daily insulin. Um, so a, a follow-up to that question is um, one of the um, attendees wanted to know that what how does um, insulin sensitivity factor ISF factor into um, to that for the TDI and um, so uh, let's yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's I got I'm it. sorry, I'm just yeah. reading through the question. Yes, that's the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is different. Uh, all the systems are a little bit different. And I know that a very popular AID system on the market 
does use AID within its algorithm. So, you know, one of the ways you can augment it is to adjust that. But our system works a little bit differently in that changing the ISF or correction factor does not affect automated insulin delivery, but it will affect the correction boluses that you deliver. And so our system is slightly different. Also, um, what's one unique feature about it is it has a smart bolus calculator. Um, so you can press UCGM and then the CGM value gets imported directly into the bolus calculator as well as the trend. So if you're say, you know, 180 double arrows up, it's gonna give you more insulin than if you had just entered in 180 without knowing the trend. So it, it does have that flexibility to give you a little bit more if your CGM is trending up and then also less if you're, you know, double arrows down, it's gonna really cut down on that recommended insulin delivery. Um, and so that's where your ISF correction factor will be primarily utilized is when you're delivering those manual boluses um, but it doesn't affect the um, automated insulin delivery that's occurring every five minutes. Great, thank you so much, Shreem. Um, The next question is, will there be coverage for Medicare patients given that the previous Omnipod Medicare challenges? Yeah, it is something we're working on, but we do have um, uh, coverage. There's, uh, you know, Medicare is just uh, really covers an enormous amount of different plans. Um, and so we, we have to work our way through individual plans and um, get coverage uh, in any which way we can. And so, um, you know, we do have selected coverage in different areas. And, and if people are curious to know, then, you know, they can always get in touch with us and um, we can check their benefits for Omnipod Dash. And if they cover, and if we cover Omnipod Dash today, there is a very high chance, high likelihood that we will cover Omnipod 5 in the future. But I, I know that, you know, these are often the most challenging part of access to technology is getting coverage. And so we do have teams and people to help people figure this thing, you know, these things out. Um, and it never hurts to ask if you're interested. Great. Um, the next question is a two-part question. Um, can you explain the PDM controller and um, and then with the app and how um, like what you get when you, if you were to you know start with Omnipod Five? Do you receive a controller? Do you not? And how how that mechanism works? I I might ask Cara to answer that question. <laughs> oh, you, right. Katie. Katie, you can answer that question. Yeah, Katie, you answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are so good. <laughs> um, I've also been a part of this study for the last uh, two years and change, and I'm part of the limited market release. And so the Omnipod 5 um, controller, am I allowed to show this train? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's probably backwards. This is the controller. And so you no, it looks see. perfect. <laughs> um, you can see 94, that's my blood sugar right here. And then you can see the insulin on board right there is zero. And then, so this is where I would be giving my insulin from. Um, I am a um, iPhone user, so I don't have access to any of the, the apps currently. And so this controller goes everywhere with me. This is what I give insulin with. However, one of the follow-up questions is, what if the controller's not with you um, right away? Um, what, what mechanisms in the actual physical pod are um, still working? And so to answer that, and Trang, let me know if I miss anything, that um, you still will receive your basal insulin regardless of your distance to the actual controller. Um, and then later, if you're using the phone app, um, so you'll still receive all of your basal, you just won't be able to bolus, um, but it, you don't have to be within range uh, by any means to either one, whichever one you're using um, to still receive that, that background insulin. Um, but then to bolus, you of course would need your controller or your app, uh, depending on what you're using. You know, and Katie, um, Wendy asked a great question too. Hi, Wendy, um, about being still being able to follow somebody on Dexcom. Oh, yes. Why don't you speak to that, Kara? Oh, yes. My phone, there's three of us all on, on Dexcom on the follow up. So you that that feature is still very important. So you can you can access that. 
Trang, I have a question with the, the app when, you know, whenever it will be available on iOS, will parents have the remote ability to bolus their child if they are at school, if they um, are using the app? Um, that's not in scope um, right now. So it's, um, that's complicated to do. Um, and so, yeah, we were, you know, maybe in some future uh, iteration, but I don't think it's something we would be able to offer in the short term. Okay. And, you know, I like, that's not coming out in a year or two. <laughs> that okay. feature. Yeah. Well, what can we expect in a year or two? <laughs> I meant well, to ask you that earlier. What, what, well, what's, most what's of the world comment? doesn't have Omnipod 5 yet, you two. Okay, yeah, I know. So. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, that's right. So we're working on Omnipod 5 for, you know, the US market, but also, you know, there are other countries as well. Right. Um, and then, you know, phone control, Um and, you know, iOS we're working on. We're working on collaboration with Omnipod 5 with other sensors, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, indication for two to six-year-olds or two to 5.9-year-olds. Like, we haven't, you know, gotten that because we're only cleared down to age six right now. And then, you know, we're exploring the use of Omnipod 5 in type two. So right now we only have clearance for type one. You know, it's not cleared for type two. So more work to be done there. Um, so there's different types of innovation. You know, I, I know you guys are very focused on product, but um, there's also, you know, getting it out to as many people as we can, um, which is, you know, what I really love as well. Um, so, yeah, lots, definitely lots going on here at Insulet. All right. Um, to follow up that question, I just keep having follow-ups. <laughs> as sensors um, are continuing to get better. Um, and this uh, audience member had a question about the, the G7. Will this be compatible once those new sensors come to market? How, um, can you speak to that? Yeah, so we have um, we have a great relationship with Dexcom so that we're, work, we're working on a G7 integration. Um, yeah, there is really some remarkable advances in um, the regulatory pathway that FDA has um, established in recent years to really try to push innovation faster. And um, so, you know, the, the sort of uh, environment that was around, you know, even as recent as 10, 15 years ago, you know, things have really changed quite a lot then. I don't know if I shared, but, you know, part of the reason why I'm here today is because when I was in Australia, we were doing research on closed loop therapy. And that was because FDA wasn't allowing that research to be done in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it was just a very different regulatory environment. And yeah, now today we have three AID systems cleared, which is just amazing because, um, you know, there, there is a risk benefit um, to everything, you know, and there are trade-offs to every decision we make. And it's really great that FDA sees the value of these technologies for patients. And it's because the diabetes community has advocated, you know, so aggressively to get better care for the community. And, you know, without the advocacy, without the work that you do to bring awareness to this condition, um, you know, without the fundraising that you do, to um, fund people like me, you know, like I was a JDRF recipient and I'm sure you guys have done the walks and, you know, like that's what paid for my first few years of fellowship. And, and that's what really fuels, um, you know, next generation of researchers and leaders in the field and, and continues the innovation. So, you know, I just really love working at Insulet. You know, the more we grow, the more, innovation we can deliver to our patients. And, and that's, you know, just so wonderful. It really is. And I think I speak for all of the type ones, just how grateful we are for the innovation and the time and the resources that are poured into uh, th these products. And I mean, just the, the brains behind all this is just fascinating. Like you said, 10 years ago, these sensors were just coming to the market and the technology was 
not good. <laughs> and so to see that advance in such a short period of time is, you know, we have you to thank um, for, for these amazing, incredible life-changing innovations. So a resounding thank you from everyone <laughs> to you and your whole team. Yeah, thanks, um, Katie. Well, there's a lot of dedicated people at Insulet and yes. it is what makes it a really wonderful place to work is like the sheer determination is really unmatched, oh. you know, so, you know, it, it we really get things done. So I'm really proud of the team for for um, everything that we've created so far. Well, congratulations to you all. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Um, a, a follow up question about the the follow with the um, the app is even if parents don't have access to remote bolusing their child when they're at school, will they be able to see a history of um, the insulin that's been delivered? Yeah. Yes. So we have that today in our Omnipod Dash system. Um, and we, we call that the um, Omnipod View app. Um, so there's an Omnipod display and the Omnipod View app. And in future, we'll also have an equivalent of that as well uh, for patients to be able to see, um, a, you know, essentially a Dexcom follower equivalent app. But we we do have that today, um, and it'll it'll just get better, you know, as technology um, improves. You know that that level of information um, is is definitely coming, um, but it's it'll be coming out later this year. That's exciting, that's great. Um, another app question was if it, it, when it becomes available on iOS, will it be available on the watch to do bolusine or um, you know the, that type of um, interoperability? Yeah, the, those are things we're looking into right now and researching, but we haven't publicly said, you know, exactly what iOS looks like and all the features there. So I can't publicly talk about it just yet. Okay, well, stay tuned. <laughs> um, I think we are just about out of time here and I wanna respect everybody's time. I know busy schedules and busy lives. Um, Trang, we are just so grateful for your time and for you, Kara, as well, just opening up your stories and um, telling us more about the Omnipod 5. I know there's so much more to come and we're excited to hear um, just as all of this gets rolled out to the commercial market. Um, is there, a, last question before we end, <laughs> um, is there any uh, openings for the limited market release for patients to, to get in on the limited market release or is that too late? And then we'll just wait. Yeah, so right now we're, um, we're full and we are um, working hard just to analyze the data that we have. And then we're gonna you know gear up shortly to make it open to people. So stay tuned, um, you can contact us. There, there is a um, interest list that you can add your name to so that uh, when it does become available, um, you will be amongst the very first people to be able to um, get your benefits checked and um, get the product. So that's really worthwhile get, getting um, part of. And, and, you know, the quickest way to really get Omnipod 5 um, is to get on Omnipod Dash today and get on G6 if you're not on that already. And that will make the transition to Omnipod 5 really quick for you. Um, so, um, so, yeah, that's what I'd recommend. And can you tell our audience where that wait list is, where they can find that? Yeah, so they they have to um, go to our website and log in, um, I believe, to so it's it's not just a website link. You you have to do some digging. Okay. I, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer to that right now. That's okay. We can include it in a follow-up email. That's no problem at all. Yeah. Great. Well. Again, thank you guys. And thank you to all of our attendees um, for taking time out of your day to learn about this. We're just so excited. And Train, we'd love to have you on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. It was such a fun time, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. All right. Good night, all. Good night. Bye. Bye.